Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah? OK. So uh, thanks to the organizers, especially to Jamir. Uh, this is a wonderful conference. It's good to be back in person and see a lot of uh, you guys. And uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm the last thing that is standing between you and lunch. So I just make this more uh, entertaining. I'll show you some videos and stuff. Uh, and actually, the previous speakers before me, they just did a very good job, especially Derek, who is not with us anymore in this room. Uh, it's too bad. <laughs> I had a few surprises for him, but OK. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I make the introduction uh, rather brief. So we already heard about real distributive systems. This is, in general, uh, could be a many body interacting driven system, and we have some dissipation. And this system uh, goes to some non-equilibrium steady state at long times, right? And the kind of thing that we're interested in is a sort of a variety of things. We would be interested in the nature of non-equilibrium phases and phase transitions. We already heard talks about this. There's a bath engineering. Depending on the bath, we can stabilize the system to go to some interesting state, and especially in the era of NISC. You know, noise and dissipation are kind of uh, intrinsic to this kind of system. So this is a definitely very relevant uh, setting. OK, but the dissipation, so in the most general setting, perhaps dissipation is acting on single atoms or ions. But in principle, the dissipation could be correlated, could uh, depend on the joint state of, let's say, two atoms. And we already heard uh, about this in previous talks. Derek's talk and the talks uh, before me, so I'm not going to talk about this too much. But in principle, if you have the right dissipation, which is uh, correlated in the right way, we can generate entangled states. We can generate uh, interesting correlations in the state. And uh, this is Jamir's paper. He's the organizer, so I have to cite him here. And uh, in the many-body domain, you can also generate interesting states. You can uh, create a BEC, ordered phases, and so on. And so what I want to say here is that uh, this is kind of the urban distributive system is kind of described by sort of this simple thing that Hamiltonian dissipation roughly don't commute, so they do interesting things with the system. There is a competition between the two of them. And when you have dissipation, which is correlated, actually even dissipation doesn't commute with dissipation, so we can do even more interesting things. Um, yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about quantum diffusion, actually. So this is a sort of a momentum-dependent depend diffusion. And this is, in fact, uh, correlated dissipation. The Limbelet, by this, by, by this time, you've heard uh, quite a bit about this uh, Limbelet. So hopefully this sounds familiar. But this is going to be sort of the uh, uh, special derivative acting on some operator. So this is definitely correlated dissipation. And what is more about this is that uh, this sort of dissipation vanishes with k going to 0. So. Uh, Particles at low moment are uh, long lived. Sometimes this decides not to. Okay. So, this is the R. A few experimental settings that, uh, you know, this is actually relevant. We have a root, uh, Rydberg polaritons under the condition of the EIT. If you're exactly on the EIT resonance, the system has uh, negligible dissipation. And in fact, if you go slightly away from the EIT resonance, you get this kind of dissipation. But this is not the only example. So this talk is not about Rydberg polaritons, but there is a sort of a, a different experimental settings that kind of fit the bill for uh, this kind of what I call quantum diffusion. OK, so the question that we want to ask is that, so we have a system that's uh, subject to sort of a lossy process. This lossy process is acting on different k-modes differently. And we want to ask what happens, for example, in some interacting uh, Bose gas, uh, I mean, naively, if you wait long enough, the system just, you know, uh, the, the state just, uh, just dies, right? And uh, so what I want to tell you is that it's actually a bit more interesting than that. Uh, it's quite a bit more interesting than that. And so this is sort of the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about uh, two different limits of this, the weakly uh, interacting Bose gas. And I will show you that there is some sort of weird KPZ. If you don't know what that is, I will explain what that is. And then this kind of leads to an abrupt uh, uh, sort of uh, a depletion of the uh, condensate. This kind of uh, destroys the condensate, but in a very abrupt and surprising way. 
And the other extreme is that when these uh, bosons are strongly uh, interacting, and like Derek talked about, in this case, you would uh, see some sort of uh, fermionization, but this is actually a bit more interesting, and you'll see some surprises there. Okay, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I don't mind taking questions. Uh, okay, so let me do a very quick kind of uh, recap of derivative and distributive condensates in general. Uh, so this is a system that's kind of described uh, by this kind of Hamiltonian. So you have kind of a bose hubbard Hamiltonian interacting bosons. In this context, uh, think about it as weakly interacting bosons. And you have some loss. The, uh, this polariton, this, in this context, these are exciton polaritons in semiconductor worlds. So they are uh, lossy. If you don't keep pumping the system, of course, you're losing everything. It's boring. So you pump the system. And when the pump is uh, larger than the lot, you get something interesting. And then the question is whether you can get a condensate for the system. The answer is, if I can get to that, uh, the answer is yes. In fact, the distributive condensates emerge. We have uh, you know, experimental evidence for this. Uh, but as, as is, this is typically, uh, as, uh, as is typically the case, in lower dimensions, we have a different story. So uh, to tell you what happens at, uh, in lower dimensions, uh, I will uh, start with the semi-classical treatment. So this is kind of a gross Pitaevsky equation, but it's a distributive version of this. So kind of mean field. And if you want, you can also put uh, noise, which is due to dissipation. And uh, a good way to think about what happens in this system is kind of to identify the soft mode. In this case, that would be the phase of the condensate and see what's the equation that's describing the phase. And this turns out to be the KPZ equation. So this is a, a non-equilibrium, truly non-equilibrium equation. You can get this from a free energy, but this system is non-equilibrium. So actually, it would be a surprise if you don't get the KPZ because you have to keep all the terms that are allowed. And in fact, this term emerges. And uh, even you don't know what KPZ is, I will just tell you that it just completely changes the physics. And in fact, you lose the algebraic uh, correlations that you would expect in the context that, uh, otherwise. So it kind of uh, changes the nature of uh, the physics. And there's been actually recently an experiment that talks about the uh, emergence of KPZ in these systems. The, the data that I looked at the production was 2D, right? It was 2D, yeah. And yet it's 1D? It could be 1D or 2D. One that's KPZ. Yes. Yes. Any more questions? Okay. So this is stuff that I actually don't want to talk about. So in this case, you see that there is loss and there is pump. That's not what I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk about quantum diffusion, and you see that I'm sort of repeating sort of a sim uh, simple mean field kind of uh, semi-classical uh, treatment here. So we get a gross Pitaevsky type equation. But notice that we don't have this damping term. It shows up as this you know, imaginary coefficient in, terms, uh, it, uh, in front of uh, this uh, um, grad x, this uh, Laplacian thing, right? So it goes into kind of the mass. Uh, so what happens here? Um, so this is uh, actually, uh, like I said, this is a lossy system. So it decays to zero unless you start from uh, a condensate, which is a wave function, which is constant. So if you have a nearly uniform wave function, you would expect that you have a long-lived condensate, but eventually it just uh, it gets destroyed. So let's actually see what happens. So this is kind of a simulation of this uh, uh, gross pitaevsky equation. And these are some scales that you would care about. This is the initial density. There is this uh, length scale, which is a healing length. And there is a characteristic time scale. So, uh, so let's see what happens. There was a small bump, I should have mentioned this, because we want to make this a slightly non-uniform. And you don't see this, but it kind of propagates. It reflects off the boundary. It becomes more visible. And suddenly, the condensate uh, gets destroyed. You have this onset of instability <laughs> and just propagates throughout the system. This is a different view of the same thing. This is kind of the space-time view that we start from. I'm not sure, sorry about this. I'm not sure this is visible, but you should see some sort of a light cone if you want, or a sound cone, if you wish. And this evolves, not much is happening, uh, life is good, and then at some point you get this, you know, uh, sudden, uh, you know, we call it singularity for reasons that become clear shortly, and then this propagates ballistically and the whole thing just gets destroyed. 
So let's see what happens. Oh, one actually observation that you can repeat this for different, this is uh, the uh, strength of quantum diffusion. Uh, you can see that this uh, singularity time scales with this in some fashion. But, you know, this is uh, obviously diverges. So if you don't have any dissipation, it's long-lived. But also if uh, the bump that I put there, there's also some scaling with this. But the get away from this, it doesn't matter actually what these uh, exponents exactly are. This is not a nucleation process, which otherwise would have been exponentially small. Something else is going on. So to understand that, let's, yeah. Ah. Okay, let's kind of repeat the same exercise. Uh, really simple principles. Uh, identify the sort of a soft mode, which is the phase of this condensate, and see what uh, equation uh, it satisfies. So it becomes a funny KPZ equation. So the KPZ equation, yeah. This is a momentum dependent uh, loss. So this is a kind of loss. Hmm? I, for example, in Rydberg polaritons, that was the example I gave in the beginning. That if you're exactly on EIT resonance, that's zero, but if you go away from that, yeah. But also, I mean, you can uh, engineer a system which just, I mean, Derek, I think, can engineer systems which behave like this. Uh, so it's more generic than that, but yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, that's really kind of, uh, yeah. So if you are, uh, yeah, so if you have interactions between different parts of the system, this is kind of relevant to the second part of my talk. But at this semi-classical level, uh, if you have like a wave function which is constant, it's not gonna decay. But if you have some uh, inhomogeneity in the system, then you have generated some non-zero k. And yeah, you can kind of say that. Different k's talk to each other. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Yes? What was the question? The question is, in many cases, you don't have one minus i gamma d, but you have i gamma d. So this is one. Uh -huh. it be in model d of our parameter? I don't think so. No, model b would conserve the order parameter. This is not, this is not conserving the order parameter. Yeah. Okay, back to the weird KPZ equation. So this is a kind of, uh, I, I call it the dispersive KPZ equation. It's not overdamped you actually have the second time derivative, so it actually looks like a wave equation. It doesn't look like an overdamped equation. But you get this non-linearity uh, which was responsible for uh, the KPZ physics. And, uh, um, okay, so first I want to convince you that this is a sort of uh, a reliable description of the physics, so I promise that I will entertain you. So this is only if I can, ah, okay. So this is, you see this dashed line, which is kind of this dispersive KPZ equation, and it very reliably describes the physics and it actually gives you the onset of this singularity. Beyond that, we have to resort to some other thing, but at least this is a good description of the system. Now that we know it's a good description, let's, uh, let me actually tell you what happens there. Okay, so for that, uh, let me actually consider the KPZ equation but put both the inertial term, that's kind of a wave-like equation, and the damping term. We don't have the damping term, but just for the sake of this argument. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, so this is actually, this is being done, yeah, this is done more systematically. So we're making an approximation. To be completely honest, this approximation is the following two things. We're assuming that the density uh, kind of perturbation on top of the average density is a small, that's one, and the other approximation is this is long wavelengths. So this high order uh, um, derivative would be just less relevant, right? 
in principle. Of the, but once you hear this argument, you would see that it actually doesn't depend. The nature of this argument is uh, general enough that the physics would kind of show up even if you have more things. Yeah, yeah. You can have high order terms in theta or high order terms in derivatives. They're less relevant and Yeah. Yeah. And I want to learn this from you, sure. There was a question. Long wavelength, but still you have to be sure that it turns out in a certain way. So you can't get to zero otherwise you would be in terms Exactly. Yes. Yes. But you know, we're not doing any like uh, fancy uh, normalization here. This is just semi classical dynamics at this point. But still in numerics you will see that there are symmetries. Yeah. Right, the numerics is honest, yeah, With, within this approximation, yeah. Okay, uh, actually how, how I'm doing on time, because I want to also get to the exciting part of the talk. I have 10 minutes in total? Okay, that's tough. So let me, I have to rush through this, but basically the KPZ, this is, this is a hard equation. You can have, I mean, people get Fields Medal for solving this, actually they have recently got, gotten Fields Medal for solving this equation, exactly. Uh, so I'm not, in, you know, my intention is not to solve this equation, but I want just to show you a exact solution here, which is this quadratic solution. It's a very simple solution. It's just a parabola with a coefficient here, curvature and a constant. And then you put this and you, I mean, at first actually you would ask me why you even bother with this very non-physical solution. But I will convince you that this actually tells us a lot about what happens. And then you put this ansatz into this equation, you get uh, this couple equation, and let's not care about the second one. It's not important, but the first one, the equation for the curvature is close in itself. So we can solve it. But we're physicists, we want to map all the problems to the same problem. So this is a kind of a particle rolling down the hill, and that describes the coefficient of this, uh, this uh, curvature. And if, so here's kind of the punchline, that if the system is overdamped, you have this uh, particle starting you know, at some point and uh, stops here at the origin. But if the system is not, does not have any kind of damping, uh, you have a runaway solution, it just rolls down, and you actually get to infinity at finite time, hence singularity. So if you have a quadratic solution, what I'm, what I'm saying is that in finite time, it just uh, explodes. Okay, now why should you care about this solution? This was a very unphysical solution. The point is that you have a kind of causality, you have a speed of uh, sound if you want. And uh, as long as you have a region that's large enough, that you can reach, you cannot reach the boundaries of this region uh, before singularity, it doesn't matter what happens outside of it. So you can have you know, something different happening, but the fact that you have causality kind of you know, with putting together with this exact solution guarantees that you would have this uh, divergence. So take a message if some technical, technical steps were not clear, Causal, the combination of causality and having not uh, a damping term, that's responsible for this uh, explosion. Okay, I don't have uh, time for this part of uh, this. Beyond singularity, we have to resort to something else. We have to do some hydrodynamics. I will rush through this. And what was kind of uh, cool that we can actually kind of find a soliton. And this is a kind of a weird soliton that's uh, stabilized by dissipation. And this is a sort of, this is what you get when you have dissipation. This describes, maybe if I have time for quickly, this is beyond singularity, the dashed line, this is kind of the solitonic solution, and then it just propagates through the system. So, uh, and you see that the core size of the soliton in appropriate units, I guess in units of one over QC, this is determined by one over dissipation. So if you don't have dissipation, you don't have solitons, but with dissipation you have this uh, soliton. Okay, this was kind of the first part of my talk. Um, it was about weakly interacting both gases. Uh, but when we ask more like interesting questions, harder questions, I mean, uh, life you know, becomes more difficult. Uh, for example, if you have a strong interactions, a semi-classical treatment would not be available anymore. So uh, without dissipation, very strong interactions, I mean, this is just equivalent in this context, becomes free fermions. 
And this is kind of described by, more generally, this is described by Heinz Girardot uh, gas, which is a highly correlated state in one dimension. Now, with dissipation, uh, this free fermion picture is just you know, out of the picture. We don't have free fermions anymore. So what do we do? OK, so let's just start concrete. So this is, again, the model, uh, just to remind you. This is now a strongly interacting bosons. If it's dissipation, there's a kind of quantum diffusion. But you actually need a cutoff at large momenta. Uh, this is because when you consider fluctuations, you have to avoid about your cutoff. So let's regularize the model. Let's put it on the lattice. So that gives you a natural cutoff. This is a kind of a bose hubbard model on the lattice. And you see that uh, dissipation is now the difference between two neighboring sites, right? So that's uh, correlated dissipation. And uh, yeah, that's kind of equivalent to having uh, quantum diffusion in the continuum limit. OK, one thing. Oh, and the limit of u going to infinity, which is what I'm going to consider in this uh, particular talk, this just becomes hardcore bosons. So that's what I'm mostly focusing on. One thing, just quick out of the way, is that jordan Wigner transformation uh, is not going to work because of this uh, nasty term, this recycling term is often the most nasty term when it comes to this equation. And you know, Jordan Wigner is just simply not going to work. Can we do better? Uh, let's actually, let's be naive. And let's just you know, write this uh, Limbalad, uh, which is in terms of this hardcore boson. Let's write it in terms of fermions. So let's completely ignore this Jordan Wigner string. And this is going to be just a simple exercise in three fermions. And in the end, what you get is actually quite simple that k equals 0 doesn't decay. So if you have uh, like fermion, some fermionic density at k equals 0, that's not going to decay. But the overall population of the system <coughs> asymptotically is going to decay like 1 over root t. OK? So this is just with free fermions, uh, which is just you know, a naive starting point. Now let's do uh, actually some exact simulation. And for this one, I want to change the perspective before I started from uh, a uniform condensate. Now I want to take uh, an extreme limit, start from an infinite temperature state, right? And I want to see what happens under this dissipation. So this is what we did with you know, uh, MPS and quantum trajectories. And let me just show you the results. So what happens is, uh, OK, for different, these are different filling fraction, the particles that you had at time 0. The, uh, you had you know, 20 or 40 or uh, 80 or something like that. And then you look at the dynamics, and you can evolve this for a very long time. And you can see that uh, asymptotically, this decays uh, like 1 over square root of t, but not exactly 1 over square root of t. You get some exponent, which is roughly around 0.6. Okay, So there's something interesting going on here. This is hardcore boson. Yeah, I apologize. Free fermions, you can just, you know. This is, this is just being honest. This is just uh, hardcore bosons and correlated dissipation. And, you know, simulate the system and see what happens. Right. With free fermions, you would just get the square root of t. But yeah, here you get something different. And you also look at k, uh, k equals 0 uh, population. But this is, I should emphasize that this is not. In fermion, this is in bosons. And you see that there is a very small decay to that. There is a very small exponent associated with that. So there is some uh, new universality, kind of a different universality. So I wish Derek was here. Uh, maybe that would have cheered him up. Uh, and one thing quickly, just to emphasize that this is uh, the kind of the average of the one domain entropy. Uh, for uh, single trajectories. And this is not a talk about entanglement phase transitions, but it's just a matter of uh, why we can simulate it to such long times. It's basically because the entanglement is uh, under control. It doesn't explode. So that's, that's good. And also, maybe there is some entanglement hidden here, but I don't have anything to say about that today. OK, the, my approach is actually not really my approach. It's really uh, a credit to this people. Uh, that the, the approach is that, OK, maybe we can't solve this problem exactly, but let's, do, let's uh, uh, treat this strong interactions exactly. But 
uh, uh, dissipation perturbatively, okay? So uh, we can do some sort of Born approximation, right? So if the system without dissipation evolves, it becomes a GGE, right? And once in a while, you have an occasional uh, loss, and then it becomes a new state, and then evolves, and then it becomes a new GGE, and then, you know, that uh, goes on for a relatively long period of time, and then another dissipation. So you have an evolving GGE in this state. Uh, and this is good because you can, you know, kind of deal with the GGE of free fermions. That sounds easy, and it is easy up to a caveat, and the caveat is that uh, free fermions are free if you're keeping yourself to one sector. If you have even or odd number of fermions, then you know you have you have a Gaussian system, uh, or Gaussian state. But in this uh, systems, the once you have a loss, you're losing one particle that changes the parity. So you have to worry about this. And in fact, the density matrix becomes sort of the sum of these two. So that makes things a bit more complicated. And uh, maybe this sounds a bit technical, but uh, uh, actually not here. Uh, this is just in general, this is uh, the Born approximation. Let's say we have some conserved quantity according to the Hamiltonian. Dissipation is not going to keep it conserved. But then, uh, like I said, the philosophy is that we can evolve GGE slowly and compute in the sort of a Born approximation type of thing, we can compute these expectation values. Yes? So my question is, like, everything is a generalized hydrodynamic You can say that, yeah. Yeah. Two minutes? Okay. Uh, you have to rush, but I think I can make it. Okay, so this term is easy. I mean, this is a sort of a technical slide, but let me just mention this very quickly. This is easy, this uh, parity preserving, because you have L layer L. The other term is hard because it changes the parity, and the price that you have to pay is that uh, this becomes actually local in momentum. This one becomes very non-local, and it kind of looks ugly. But uh, there's a nice trick uh, which is introduced by, uh, by the gentleman that you can actually uh, kind of map. Uh, they did this in different contexts, but uh, you can map this to an uh, uh, analytic function, and this becomes the real part of that, blah, blah. I'm not gonna go through that, but this is actually, this is uh, sort of, uh, and I'm also going to move beyond this, or actually not. Uh, so you can, this is a different kind of dissipation, but it becomes, uh, you know, and this is a typo, sorry, this is not zero. This is the dynamical equation. But what is nice about this is that this is, in some sense, exact, in the limit of gamma going to zero, and you know, it has nice things into it. It, you know, you see that something is uh, you know, non-linear here. So that means that dissipation actually, it was free fermions, but the dissipation is kind of, uh, you have an effective interaction, which is induced by interaction, and it contains a lot of physics. So I don't have to tell you, I, I, I don't have time to tell you more about this, but let me actually jump ahead, and let me say that you can actually, this, this is now becomes an ODE in the complex plane, right? And we can do this, and we actually find that, you know, we can evolve this, and we actually find these exponents, you know, 0 0.59 for the decay of this. So this is definitely this, this thing from free fermions. And for free fermions, we didn't have any decay of k equals 0, but here we have some very slow decay. And uh, let me kind of go through this quickly. We can kind of identify sort of a dynamic exponent in this system, and the dynamic exponent would be kind of uh, the inverse of this guy, somehow, and this now becomes super diffusion. And uh, so this is, uh, this is, again, another extreme example why this is uh, different from free fermions. And there is some interesting uh, possible connection to KPZ, which uh, actually we don't, we don't really understand. Uh, but, okay, this is the last slide before going to the summary that, uh, you know, this is kind of, uh, we have, if you look at the momentum space, you see that at time zero, this we started from like infinite temperature state, so there was no structure to this. But as time goes on, you see a little bit of decay at k equals zero, but you see a huge decay at larger values of k, right? So this is, you get this uh, kind of a condensate, and this is in the spirit of this uh, uh, engineered dissipation. One thing I would add to this though is that typically you have this engineered dissipation in the steady state. In this case, my steady state is just completely boring. Uh, there's nothing in the steady state. But the dynamics is slow and structured enough that gives you some interesting state uh, at 
uh, intermediate times. Okay, so with that, let me just leave you with my summary slide and thank you for your attention. <laughs>